Today we are holding a book launch uh, on across the three pagodas pass, the story of the Thai Burma Railway, which is originally written by a Japanese professional engineer. Uh, when uh, our friend Paul, uh, Mr. Paul Noble, brought in, uh, well, offered this book launch, I kind of felt, um, being a Japanese, um, POWs and then the story of this uh, Thai, Thai Burma Railway uh, always makes me feel a, a little bit uncomfortable. Although I was born after the war, obviously whatever our uh, fellow Japanese did in the past, and then which is not really a very uh, nice thing, always makes me kind of feel uncomfortable. But then uh, I read the, the details of the book, and then I just felt like um, it's mm. something like um, maybe I wouldn't exactly say taboo, but Japanese people wouldn't like to talk about uh, this uh, topic particularly. But this is originally written by Japanese, and I just thought, what does he want to say? Uh, I was quite interested, and uh, I was talking with uh, Peter, uh, Professor Peter Davis uh, here. Uh, a while ago, and he said perhaps this might be the only um, um, book uh, in, in English uh, which is originally uh, written by a Japanese, uh, so to speak, to look at this um, um, uh, topic from a Japanese uh, perspective. Mm. So uh, I'm quite uh, uh, personally interested what uh, Professor Peter Davis can uh, tell us uh, today. And uh, I'd like to introduce um, um, Professor Peter Davis. He translated this book into English. But he's Emeritus Professor of Economic History at Liverpool University, a former president of both the International uh, Commission for Maritime History and of the International Maritime Economic History Association. And he has also served as a visiting professor at Musashi University, Tokyo, and at Shudo University, Hiroshima. And he's the author of numerous books, including the uh, trade makers uh, Elder Dem sorry, uh, Dempster in West Africa, which was uh, published in 1973. The man behind the, the bridge, uh, Colonel uh, Tosi, and the River Kwai, which was published in 1991, and most recently, the uh, business Life and Letters of Frederick Corns, Aspect of the uh, Evolutions of Commerce in Modern Japan, uh, 1861 to 1910, which was published in 2008. <coughs> but I'm not going to say anything uh, on that, so I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I prefer to sit and speak rather than use the microphone. If you can't hear me at the back, perhaps you'd uh, indicate. In, oh, this oh, this one's fine. You can hear me okay? Yep. Fine. Yep. Thank you. Well, uh, I'd first like to welcome you to this somewhat belated um, book launch to the work of uh, Potomazzo and his translator, I didn't translate this, it was a Mr. Hewitt uh, Eskret. And in particular, I would like to welcome members of, of um, Hewitt's family for their presence here tonight. Regret regrettably, Hewitt's widow, Mrs. Youth Eskret, uh, isn't too well and can't be here tonight, but she does send her best wishes um, uh, for the success of this book launch. Of the deaths of Hewitt and Futamatsu and my own commitments to other projects have been major factors in the delay to this publication. However, in view of the importance of expressing the Japanese viewpoint on the building of the Thai Burma Railway, I trust you feel that the wait has been worthwhile. It's my intention to outline the background to my involvement and research, rather than discuss the contents of the book in every detail. After all, you can uh, read this for yourself if you acquire a copy. So. 
by academic interests were and largely remain in maritime economic history and involve research into British shipbuilding and uh, ship operating. The rapid post-war decline of the British industries and the rise of Japan, which surpassed Britain by 1955, uh, let me, made me look uh, closely at Japan. And this was confirmed when the Liverpool shipping companies I was concerned with started to buy all their ships in Japan. So in 1971, I published a, a study of the Elder Dempster uh, line. This is a, a major Liverpool company under the title of the Trade Makers. And after it was complete, I gave a talk to its Pensioners Association, who were naturally quite interested. And at that time, the president of their association was a man called Philip Tuzzi. And after the talk, he came to me and said, would I write his biography? He explained that the bridge over the River Kwai, the film, had upset many of his friends, who felt that as he was the senior British officer, portrayed by Alec Guinness, that he was being unjustly accused of being helpful to the Japanese. Thus they insisted that his real story needed to be told. And although he was an, essentially a very private person who didn't want any, any publicity, he eventually agreed and then turned to me and said, I'd like you to write uh, my biography. And when I said why, he said, you are the only author I know. So that put me in my place. <laughs> so after much deliberation, I fell under his spell and then began a series of weekly meetings at his home, which was near Liverpool. And this resulted more than 50 hours of taped interviews. Copies of these are available in the um, Imperial War Museum in, and are, ex are quite extensively uh, used by other scholars. Now, I had previously published a number of biographies uh, not of military personnel, but I was familiar <coughs> with many secondary sources. So they helped to uh, supplement <coughs> the taped interviews. And I also discovered that at least 50 of his contemporaries, prisoners of war, had written their own accounts of their captivity. And because of Tuzzi's status as the senior British officer, all had, uh, or virtually all, had sent in copies, so I had access to those. And now, in addition to this, the literature on the Pacific War is very extensive. So I, I was able to build up a picture of this uh, subject and the man quite quickly. Now, a more specific need was to understand the physical aspects of what uh, Tuzi and other prisoners of war had um, suffered in uh, Thailand and decided, in association with the Tuzi family, that it would be useful to go to Thailand and retrace his steps. Now at that time, Tuzi was also the president of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and by chance the Liverpool School had set up, or helped to set up, a similar institution in Bangkok. So using Tuzi's influence, uh, Patrick, his eldest son, and I went to Bangkok, where the school were very happy to send, uh, to help us to go to the north of the country, and provided uh, a number of uh, doctors uh, to go with us. Uh, 
on the excuse that it was an area, a remote area, that they very seldom um, visited. So we, we went up the River Kwai by boat and ended up in a, uh, a missionary hospital, a place called Nekhe. And uh, this is a great experience because Nekhe was in what was then called the Golden Triangle, an area of great um, upset and dispute. But the hospital taught all the locals, all the rebels and all the, <laughs> the government officials without fear or favour, and the hospital was regarded as neutral ground. Well, from there, Patrick and I uh, walked, or were to walk, to the, the three pagodas pass. And it's very interesting, I think, of how we proposed to do this. The police said they would uh, give us an escort. Remember, this is a time when there's all sorts of problems in the area. So, so we joined this, uh, the police escort and found to our surprise that the, the escort was led by an elephant. <laughs> and the elephant walked in advance of the police and ourselves, carrying the gear and equipment, and that was fine. But the, the added bonus was that if uh, any landmines had happened to be uh, laid, uh, the ele poor elephant would have got the benefit. Now, <laughs> fortunately, that didn't happen, but there we are. Uh, another thing was that when I knew I was going to walk in the jungle, um, knowing nothing about these things, I went down to our local army and navy stores and bought a special pair of boots. So, before this great this walk to Three Pagodas Pass, I, I um, put my new boots on, and I'd gone about a hundred yards, and we came to a little stream. And I walked through this stream and, and squelched for the rest of the day, as you can imagine. Now, our guide wore flip-flops, and he was far better off than I was, I can tell you. Anyway, so uh, we got to the three, uh, not quite to the, to the past, but we got to the railway. And sadly, there was very little left there a pathway, basically. There were no rails. Why were there no rails? Well, after the, um, the end of the 1945 war, uh, Burma, of course, became independent, and they decided that they didn't want to have this communication with, with Thailand. And that was a political uh, decision. A little bit later, local people realised that these rails were a very valuable asset. And over the years, they removed them and sold them. So <laughs> rails are that part of Northern Thailand. The present railway only goes about halfway uh, uh, from um, into the jungle. Okay. But it is still used uh, quite extensively. Well, this was the dry season, but even so, exploring the terrain in this way gave me some idea of the terrible physical conditions that heavy work had to be undertaken by the prisoners. Of course, when high temperatures, excessive rain, untreated disease were also present, it was much worse especially with a poor diet and insufficient, practically non-existent clothing. And on my return to Bangkok, I was able to interview a number of the Thai citizens who made it the, their mission to try to help the prisoners. And they did this by smuggling money, food, medicines into the camps. And the two in particular that, that I met were both uh, honoured by the British government uh, after the war and also given financial support by the Prisoners of War Association. I then uh, visited Japan and was able to combine interviewing uh, 
people from the River Kwai with my uh, academic work. These included Sergeant Major Saito. He was the man who was second in command at Tamakan, which was the bridge camp in for building the bridge over the Kwai. And he worked very closely with this man, Tuzi, quite unlike the situation in the film. And as a result of their cooperation, the very severe, strict regime was modified in a little way, so that Tuzi was able to, to negotiate a rest day. Uh, now, you think, we in the West, we think of perhaps having one day in seven. Well, that wasn't possible, but he negotiated one day in ten, and that was a great bonus. And he, he also uh, arranged other very small concessions, but totally, in that situation, they were very helpful. And one of the long-term consequences of this was when the war was over and an investigation was undertaken, to see which of the Japanese were war criminals, Tuzi exonerated this man Saito. And at a later stage, I got to know Saito extremely well, and he was uh, more of him later. Another major railway officer who I interviewed was Ranichi Sugano. And he um, served on for the whole length of the period the railway was being built and operated. Now, he had a personal interest in photographer, in photography. He, that was his hobby. So he took many, many pictures of the railway, which were great. So provided a, a comprehensive record. It was very, very helpful. And interestingly, after the war, he set, bought a shop in Shinjuku in Tokyo and set up a photographic business where up till very recently, a couple of few years ago, he specialised in weddings and family portraits. So he's a, a perfectly <laughs> happy photographer. And he joined he, he, the uh, railway regiment where he met the man we really want to talk about tonight, um, Futamatsu. Now, my own association with Futsumatsu began when I was introduced to him by an American uh, bomber pilot, a man who, who had flown his liberator from, from India to bomb the, uh, the bridge over the Kwai. And he got to know Futsumatsu, and he went, knowing that I was in Japan, he arranged an introduction. And this led to many meetings in Kyoto, where Futamatsu uh, lived in, in a, a very ancient and drafty Tokugawa house, a very interesting house. He was born in Kyoto in 1912 and graduated from his local university with a degree in engineering in 1936. In view of later events, it's not surprising that his student project was to assist in the construction of a railway bridge over a, a, a local small river near Osaka. Well, after graduation, Futamatsu joined Japan National Railways and became a civil engineer in its construction bureau. And he spent five years there before being called up uh, to serve as a, a civilian auxiliary. And ultimately, he was made responsible for the proposed Thai Burma link. And his major job was to finalize the survey and design all the bridges up to the, the, the Burma uh, border. Now, all of this information was, of course, highly useful to me. To my uh, account of <laughs> Colonel Tuzi, and I published these in due course. Uh, and um, as this project 
uh, Colonel Toosey had the support of the Prisoners of War Association, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh got involved and very kindly wrote the introduction. And this work book, of course, included many references to this man, Futamatso, but necessarily concentrated on Toosey. And it was only at a very late date in interviewing Futamatso that he told me he had in fact written his memoirs in, and they'd been published in Japanese in 1955. Why he hadn't told me earlier, I'm not quite sure, but it, 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 perhaps he, he was shy, I don't know. <laughs> but once I realised this, I made arrangements with him to be uh, his literary agent and got permission from him uh, to uh, have them translated and then published in due course. And that was the, the grand plan, but it was a very general plan. Now, at that stage, I, was, I already knew Ewart uh, Eskert, who had served with Toosey in various prisoners of war camps. As Captain uh, Eskert, he'd been captured at Singapore, but was then moved uh, at a later stage to take part in the construction of the railway. He had no previous knowledge of Japanese, but he had a good ear, and during his captivity, and after his homecoming, he devoted himself to learning the language, and became expert in both spoken and, very impressively, uh, written aspects of the language. <coughs> now, I, I was aware of this, and I also received a recommendation from Professor Louis Allen, who was quite um, an eminent scholar at this time, and this led uh, me to inform Muret of Futamatsu's work and uh, write a letter of introduction. Um, he then took up this uh, challenge and was engaged a very lengthy correspondence with Futamatsu as a result of which he then spent many years translating his work. Now at the same time, while this was uh, ticking over, I persuaded my publisher, my book on Tuesday, that the finished product of, foot, of the Futamatsu biography would make an ideal companion volume. But sadly, this did not proceed as arranged. This was partly due to the publisher requiring both a substantial um, uh, subvention, not surprising, Paul, <laughs> and a substantial revision of the manuscript. Now, both of these difficulties might well have been re resolved over time. But the death of Ewart was a critical factor which could not be easily overcome. Fortunately, I was able to retain Futamatso's uh, permission to continue with this project, and with the approval of Mrs. Ruth Esker, and the aid, I must acknowledge, of the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation, it's finally enabled this translation to be published. Now, in, in addition to Futamatso's memoirs, the present volume also includes an account of Ewart's time as a prisoner of war. He was, therefore, well qualified to comment in his introduction on Futamatso's attitudes and opinions as indicated in, in the writing. Thus he criticises Futamatsu's views on Japan's failure <coughs> to follow the international conventions on prisoners of war, which he argues that even if Japan had not signed the final one, 
it was widely expected that all civilized nations would, would follow their provisions. He was also surprised to learn that Futamatso violently objected to the title of, given to the railway of the Death Railway, because Futamatso was well aware of the statistics. But of greater significance was his refusal, Futamatso's refusal, to condemn the military authorities uh, for starting and continuing even when they knew that supplies of food and medicines were totally inadequate for the number of people that were uh, engaged in this uh, project. However, it must be said, these aspects were not Futamatso's priorities. He was much more concerned with technical matters and how any difficulties could be solved in providing a secure supply line to the Japanese army in Burma. That's his priority. And it, you have to remember at this stage that following Japan's early victories, the beginning of the Pacific War, the communications were so stretched that they placed an impossible burden on an already inadequate Japanese mercantile marine. Even in peacetime, the Japanese mercantile marine was not really big enough, and it certainly wasn't big enough uh, once Japan had very, very extensive um, t uh, territories to, 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 to supply. So, amongst other attempts to make the best of the existing tonnage was a decision to utilize the port of Bangkok instead of the one at Rangoon. And this would save about 1,200 miles on a round trip to Japan, obviously making the shipping side more efficient. It also had the advantage that it would lessen the, journey, the, the danger from Allied aircraft and submarines based in India. So the Japanese uh, decided that they would go ahead, but the snag with this plan was, of course, it was necessary to link the railway, the railway networks of Burma with that of Thailand. And there was a gap of 262 miles through mountainous terrain and jungle in an area which has one of the world's uh, heaviest rainfall, practically uninhabited. And uh, these, these problems were such that various attempts by the, 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 the Burmese, the colonial government of Burma, and commercial interests to build such a railway uh, had been uh, deemed impractical. However, a secret Japanese survey was undertaken in 1939. And the Japanese were very fast for far-sighted in this respect. And this concluded that it would be possible to build such a link, assuming that modern machinery methods uh, were available. Using this survey as a template, if you like, Japanese headquarters decided uh, that this would be desirable and Futsumatsu was instructed to take the plans forward. Sadly, when Futsumatsu was involved, there was no modern machinery. The only way that they could construct this railway was but by having uh, human resources, maximize human resources, were equipped essentially only with hand tools and dynamite. 
Well, obviously, if you were going to uh, pursue this, you then needed a huge amount of labor. And of course, the labor, Japan at this stage had, a, I've seen the figure of 300,000 prisoners of war, something on those lines, a huge, a massive number. So that they decided against all the conventions to employ prisoners in this way. Well, in, in, in the event, and this is uh, hugely impressive, uh, building this railway has been likened to building the pyramids. You know, it was such a huge, impossible task. They built the railway in 18 months. But the cost was paid by at least 20,000 prisoners of war who died, at least 70,000 and perhaps 100,000 local labourers, and don't let's forget 500 of Japanese and Koreans. Now, having built the railway, let's see what happened next. The original aim was for the railway to carry 3,000 tons a day, <clears throat> but the poor quality of construction reduced this target by completion to 1,000 a day. And although a number of locomotives were imported from Japan, virtually everything else was second-hand located locally. For example, the rails for this railway were largely re existing rails in Malayan branch lines, which were taken up and used to this purpose. The bridge itself over the River Kwai had um, came from Java. It was a second-hand bridge, though I, I was pleased to learn it had never been erected. I, you know, I, I wondered if the poor people in Java were suddenly deprived of their bridge. This was not the case. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it shows this was a railway built on a shoestring. In practice, the throughput was further limited by Allied air attacks, and over its lifetime, the railway was only able, able to average about 400 tons a day. I'm sorry to give you these statistics, but they're critical, because in addition to that, the railway also moved a lot of troops forward for the attack on India. It's claimed to have uh, evacuated 10,000 wounded from the battle for India, and it's also en enabled the surviving Japanese units to withdraw from India back to the Thai border in a relatively good order, much better order than, than if it had to walk. And but for the atomic bomb, they would have set up a, a very strong defence line uh, on the Thai border at Three Pagodas Pass. However, back to the actual tonnage, you see they were carrying 400 tonnes. Now, if uh, we look at the other side of the picture, it's fairly clear that the British Army uh, faced similar problems to the Japanese. And we had um, uh, according to General Slim, who was the British commander of the, the army in Burma, the original supply line was from was a railway designed to cope with the Assam tea industry. And that could supply about 600 tons a day. It's better than the Japanese. However, over time, they developed that line 
to such an extent that with the aid of an American whole division of railway men and locomotives from America, by the end of the war, they were supply supplying over 7,000 tons a day. And both Slim and Putamatso see this as the critical factor for the, the, the battle for, for Reindeer and then Burma. Now, following the end of the Pacific War, Futamatso was interned for about a year as a prisoner of war before he was repatriated. And during this period, he experienced many of the feelings and resentments felt by the British uh, captives who had been forced to work, work on the railway and many of his reactions were the same as theirs. This change in roles may, may well have influenced his viewpoint and be reflected in his memoirs. But any assessment of his opinions should also take account of many other factors. It should be remembered that Futamatso grew up and was educated in the 1930s when access to non-Japanese sources of information were very limited and pressure to conform was very strong. These aspects became even greater during the wartime era. So a number of his ideas were inevitably based on incorrect preconceptions. In spite of these constraints, Futamatsu's writings produced for his Japanese contemporaries, he wasn't trying to satisfy people in the West, he was talking to himself to Japanese, represent his honestly held views and helped to provide a balance to the almost entirely Western-inspired literature which dominates this subject. Now, on his return to Japan, Futamatsu resumed his career with uh, Japan National Railways, but left in 1961 and joined the High Speed Railway Company, for whom he assisted in designing the new Kobe uh, rail network. Then in 1974, he set up his own firm as a consultant and advised on many engineering schemes before beginning a gradual period of retirement, which was vir virtually complete by the time of our last meeting, which was in 1990. I hope this doesn't sound like ancient history, but time flies. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I trust you have found this account of my association with Futamatso and with, with you at Ethridge to be of interest. I would now like to conclude by thanking my publisher, Mr. Paul Newbury, for his constant support and to the Daiwa uh, Corporation for arranging tonight's meeting. Thank you very much.